let me uh, be the first to introduce and, and, and welcome and greet our speakers for the afternoon. Uh, Sarah Emily Wilson and Jesse Fleming are early career researchers from the University of Virginia. Uh, Sarah is a special education doctoral student um, in the curriculum, instruction, and special education program at, this, uh, Scurry, at the Curry School of Education and Human Development. She earned her bachelor's and master's in elementary education and in special education from the University of Florida. Her research interests um, include pragmatic language development and reading comprehension, as well as cooperative learning interventions for students with autism. She's also interested in professional development to support co-teaching and inclusion for in-service teachers. Jesse Fleming is a doctoral student at the University of Virginia studying special education also. And before coming to Curry, Jesse was a high school instructional coach and for a fully inclusive school for students with autism. Jesse's research interests are in improving academic and social outcomes for students with autism through the application of evidence-based practices. Jesse's also interested in examining ways to better understand and apply journal impact factor and open access and preprint policies and tenets of open science in the field of special education. And we, the program committee and I, we, we specifically wanted to make sure that the early career researcher uh, perspective was provided to this audience was um, because it's so key to all the work that's um, going on right now and obviously the um, types of practices and types of norms and culture uh, we want to have in the next year in the next five years in the next 10 years and so understanding their perspective their recommendations uh, is uh, super critical for that um, they'll be talking about their some of their impressions over what's happened in the past uh, 48 hours, what we've seen, what, uh, um, what, what ongoing work is most interesting to them, uh, and talking about the future of open science and educational research or in, in educational research. So um, without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to them. And I might, uh, let me double check to see if you have permissions to do that. And I'll pass it on to you. Uh, oh, come on. Okay, you should be able to do it now. Okay, thanks, David. Wait one moment while I share my screen. That's the uh, the theme of twenty twenty. 2021 now. In 2021 now, yes, thank you. All right. Well, um, we appreciate uh, this opportunity from the Center of Open Science to um, provide more of a maybe a unique perspective as we close out this amazing conference. Um, we, we imagine that there are probably some educational researchers out there who are similar to Sarah, Emily and I in that uh, we're still learning about open science and how we can involve. And so we hope, we hope to speak to a, a broad audience today, but we especially hope that this message will be meaningful for, for those of you who are new to um, open science. Uh, thanks, Jesse. Uh, yes, we're, we're very excited to be here uh, and are quite honored and, uh, you know, again, just excited to, to be able to talk with you guys today and kind of reflect on the past two days. Uh, so today we are going to structure our remarks around kind of three broad themes. Uh, the first is the why of open science, and this includes um, a bit of reflection on uh, conversations that we've had over the last two days. Um, cultural changes that we think need to occur for this transformation and adoption of open science practices uh, to be successful. And then uh, we're going to conclude by kind of speaking to early career researchers, uh, middle career researchers, and senior researchers about what each of us can do uh, to support this change, uh, both in our unique roles uh, and our you know, where we are in our careers, but also how we can uh, contribute to the work of others in, in kind of moving this this shift forward. Um, so to you know, circle back uh, to our origin stories, uh, I would say my origin story was not a love at first sight kind of an origin story with open science. Uh, when I began my doctoral program, 
I had no idea what open science was or how it might apply to my work. And frankly, it wasn't like overly compelling to me. Um, many of the kinds of open science primers that I was reading uh, discussed replication and the replica replicability crisis in our uh, fields of education and psychology. Uh, and as a first semester doctoral student, none of that meant a whole lot to me uh, at that time. So there, there was a lot of discussion of you should care about this. And I didn't have enough knowledge to know that I should care about it. Um, but that shifted for me when I stumbled across some readings related to more of the underlying cultural shifts associated with open science. Uh, and the focus of these readings were much more philosophical in nature. Um, and they grappled with messier issues, uh, like who has access to resources? What do we do to make our work more honest and trustworthy? Um, and those were the kind of questions that caught my attention and continue to catch my attention as a researcher. Uh, but, but that's really what drew me in. Uh, for me, open science was attractive because it wasn't just about how we did our work, uh, but also um, who we are as we do our work. Uh, who, what do we value? Are our actions aligned with the scientific values that we uh, say that we believe in? Are we actively trying to um, move knowledge in our field forward and better the lives of the individuals who we support? Or are we gatekeeping knowledge and prestige? Are we trying to come up with the next newer, bigger, better thing um, that may not actually ever benefit anybody? Um, so this is the part of open science, the kind of cultural shift behind the work that we do um, that was particularly compelling to me at that time and, and remains very compelling to me. Um, so for me as an early career researcher, um, you know, new to the field, uh, open science isn't just about solving problems of practice in our field, but it's about changing the culture of the field uh, that undergirds those problems and ultimately allows them to uh, continue. Thanks, Sarah Emily. I, I really enjoy hearing everyone's origin story. I mean, it makes me feel like a superhero, first of all, but uh, it's just interesting to see how everyone, you know, finds their way to uh, this movement, I guess you could call it. But um, I was originally drawn to research. Uh, I started reading about evidence-based practices for kids with autism, and that's been a pretty uh, important topic in special education over the last 10 years. And um, as I began to read more about evidence-based practice, I found an interesting argument from my, my future advisor, uh, Dr. Brian Cook, about maybe we should rethink um, how much we know about the practices that we use, or, or maybe uh, we can start implementing uh, you know, these open science practices that really aim to make our research more uh, credible and, and transparent and reproducible. And, this argument really, it, it struck a chord with me. And uh, although I'm very much a novice when it comes to research, uh, th the movement was very intuitive and logical for me. And so I, I was really drawn to open science for um, ideological reasons. Uh, and interestingly enough, many early career researchers that I also talked to about this, they, al they also find the arguments to be very compelling. Um, as I begun to kind of engage in these practices myself and, and watch uh, more senior researchers engage in these practices, really the value has really become cemented in my mind of how important they are. Uh, for example, Sarah, Emily and I, we're, uh, we're working on a meta-analysis together and we're, we're modeling our paper after a previous, previously published uh, meta-analysis on a similar topic. And, those researchers who published that paper, they posted some open materials in conjunction with their manuscript. And it actually really made our job a lot easier as we were developing our own code book and, and project workflow. And, and so it's, this is just one example of many of how we've come across really the value of open science in our work to really increase transparency and uh, support future research. Okay. So why open science? Uh, when you think about integrity and, 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 uh, and credibility, they're really the foundation of, of science. And um, we all know that a foundation is critical to a house. We've all watched Property Brothers, right? The good news, it's a small crack. The bad news, it's gonna cost 20 grand. Uh -huh. Maybe you don't watch Property Brothers. Um, but but it's, it's really the foundation of what we do and, and without 
a, a strong foundation, really, uh, there's minimal benefit to society and, and really the public loses trust in what we do. And lately it seems like there's been kind of this movement towards a rejection of science. We see it from the public, from practitioners sometimes, and even other researchers. And so one of the best ways we believe to kind of improve that image, increase credibility and integrity is to be more open and transparent. Now that this is challenging, it's hard to be vulnerable and, and put everything out there, but we believe it's a, it's a necessary step to, to earn trust. We also think it's important to note that openness relates not only to results, but also to processes. And so, yes, we believe that everyone around the world should have access to our, our, our published articles and results, but maybe more importantly, how we design and conduct our studies, uh, our, our methods, analyses, and code should also be transparent. And then lastly, I, I think it's important that we, we don't ignore the limitations of science, but we, we actually embrace them. I mean, being open about how we can improve really allows us to frame this movement as a revolution instead of a crisis. A, a crisis kind of implies we don't know what we're doing, uh, you know, we don't have any direction, we don't know how to respond to a situation, but a revolution kind of means that, implies that we're working together, that we have a common goal and we want to improve the credibility of our work. And so I think we must address credibility and integrity issues that arise, but we should look at them really as an opportunity to change and improve as, as, a, as a research base, as a group of scientists uh, hoping to improve outcomes for students and schools and, and teachers. Um, so continuing this theme, you know, I, I'm involved in um, several, you know, online spaces really focused on like early career researchers, researchers from historically marginalized backgrounds in academia and kind of discussing, you know, what are problems that exist within academia? What are the barriers that people from uh, communities that have been um, not as included in academia in the past, what are the barriers that they see um, as uh, inhibiting them from like fully accessing academia, fully accessing um, kind of this, this space, this research space that we all exist in. Um, and a lot of the barriers uh, go to uh, equity of work, democratization, um, and that idea that um, things have been, uh, there's been gatekeeping, things have been closed. Um, and I think open science uh, can move beyond just addressing uh, reputation but also, again, address this, um, this kind of culture uh, that we have. And this, to me, as an early career researcher, um, again, is really valuable, it's really compelling to me, and it's really important. So how do we, how do we shift uh, the work that we do and the culture of the work that we do uh, to ensure that our work um, is better for the people who come after us? Um, so I think, again, open science practices can speak to this uh, and underlying issues um, that we, we see within our field um, can be addressed by open science by supporting uh, equity, democratization, um, efficiency, and the reproducibility of our work uh, by adopting open science practices. Um, so when we think about specific open science practices, um, and we, I heard this touched on in um, a couple different sessions, um, different practices can contribute uniquely, uh, but also build on each other to increase the equity and democratization of um, our practice. Um, open access, preprints, open data, open materials, uh, these all support more equitable access uh, to research and research materials uh, for those without access. So this includes other researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and frankly, anyone who doesn't have a university library system that has removed that paywall uh, for you. Um, and I think that's, that's really important and that takes an important step towards equity within our work. Um, another step towards equity and democratization, I think, is through registered reports. Um, I think there's a really unique opportunity uh, through registered reports to diversify who gets to ask questions and what questions that they get to ask. Uh, a big problem, uh, at least in the field of special education, is that uh, the majority of large grants only go to a handful of uh, researchers at a handful of institutions. Um, and not only does this limit the representation of our sample, uh, but it also limits the representation of the background, perspectives, and philosophies of those getting to ask research questions. Um, so register reports help spread and share expertise before the research process truly begins. 
Uh, and it contributes not only to the democratization of research capital, but also makes our work more efficient. Um, there is a ton of pressure. Um, I feel it as an early career researcher. I'm sure you all feel it, uh, regardless of where you are in your career, uh, to be publishing on your independent line of inquiry, publishing new and novel findings. You know, what are you contributing to the field that's new? Um, however, I ask myself a lot, it's like, is that actually what's best for our field? Is that actually what's best for the students that I say that I support? Is that the most helpful for them? Um, so, so thinking about, you know, what, what actually makes our work more efficient, um, and I think, again, a lot of these open science practices support that. Um, our work is more efficient when we uh, share data and code. Uh, others are able to ask research questions from our existing data sets and apply our code to their new work. Uh, it becomes easier to replicate studies um, when we engage in practices like open materials and free registration. Uh, when I was originally conceiving of my dissertation, uh, this is prior to COVID, it has since shifted. Uh, I wanted to do a conceptual replication of an intervention treatment package. Uh, the materials though needed for the training, data collection, intervention implementation, everything was available, uh, but it was behind a long process of emailing, networking, and applying to get those things from the original authors. And so COVID aside, I'm not sure I would have been able to actually pull it off because there were so many barriers between me as a researcher and those materials. Uh, and that, it just makes me think about like the knowledge we could move forward in our field with if these things were more available to everybody, if there was more equity, if there was more efficiency in our work. Um, it's a way of passing on expertise and knowledge and resources to newer generations of researchers uh, that I think ultimately makes our field stronger, uh, but also makes the lives of the practitioners, families, and children that we support, I think it makes their lives better as well. And that leads into that kind of final component of uh, the efficiency of our work in making the research to practice gap uh, smaller and making our work getting into the hands of uh, practitioners and the people in the field, making that a more efficient and uh, quicker process. Okay, so uh, we're kind of moving into the second step of our, our outline here, uh, the cultural shifts that, that need to that we think need to happen. And uh, this first one really touches on some barriers. Um, we've talked about a lot of these over the last two days, um, but we think it's important to, to touch on them again. But open science, clearly, be, you know, over the last two days, we've seen that it's becoming more common in education research. Um, but we believe that, you know, maybe through additional supports and incentives, uh, we might be able to uh, improve uptake of, of open science practices. So um, we have their education specific training and resources, um, maybe resources for diverse educational methodologies, um, ethical considerations when thinking about data, what's student data, um, maybe how open science can support, you know, the research to practice gap and, and uh, even how we can maybe engage in director conceptual replications across different classrooms and students. So, you know, these are just a few examples of maybe where we could have some additional trainings and supports. Um, there definitely has been some uh, resources developed recently, uh, but we have found that dissemination and access to those resources can be a problem. Um, Sarah Emily and I have really talked about uh, that second one a lot, integrating multiple practices. Uh, we've really struggled to know how to sustain and integrate multiple practices across the lifetime of a paper. And you know, we understand for the most part how to, to implement and use you know, these one-off different open science practices, but uh, it might be helpful to have more resources and guides that really explica explicate to researchers what should be done in each phase of a research project. We also believe that mentoring is key to uh, this cultural shift um, senior researchers can do so much for early career researchers um, so that we can better understand and navigate this community. Um, mentoring can look very different uh, depending on the situation, but it could include opportunities to do one or more of these practices together collaboratively, uh, provide opportunities for service within the community, provide resources, or even uh, kind of initiate maybe more of a grassroots uh, 
program like a journal club. Um, and lastly, uh, we, we view the need uh, of, we need buy-in from all stakeholders, journals and publishers, institutions, uh, professional organizations. It's really gonna be challenging to have widespread change, cultural change without uh, buy-in from all of the uh, important stakeholders in our field. Now, moving down to that second point, incentives. Um, we also believe that incentives need to change or you know, shift to match the changes in research output that we'll be providing. Uh, promotion and tenure committees can consider open science practices. Um, hiring committees could add open science practices in their searches. And really institutions and, and funders could do more to value diverse output, such as open code, open data sets, and even multi-site collaborations. I, uh, I recently watched a, a presentation from Anne Scheel. She's a, an early career researcher in the Netherlands. And uh, her presentation, I really like this metaphor, was vanguard or cannon fodder, early career researchers on the front line of open science. And I, I, th I think that metaphor is really compelling. Uh, are, we, are we pushing researchers, especially early, early career researchers to the front lines and asking them to change the research culture without changing really how we support and evaluate and incentivize that research. You know, and so when you think about it, are researchers going to be leading the charge for change or will they find themselves you know, without employment, uh, without tenure as the, the culture failed to value, value their work? So we really believe, especially for early career researchers that incentive structures need to change um, to value open science and diverse output as we move forward. Um, along with incentives uh, to, to accomplish these changes, I think we have to also consider uh, effective aspects of our research or culture. Uh, as Jesse mentioned, there's kind of this inherent vulnerability uh, to openness and transparency, uh, particularly given the current culture in our field. Um, I wrote a newsletter on open peer review with uh, Brian Cook a few weeks back, and that, that literature was just so interesting to dive into because uh, peer review in many, many ways can embody a lot of these cultural issues within our field. Um, I'm sure we've all experienced getting peer reviews back that halfway through we kind of take a pause and are like, well, that no longer feels constructive towards bettering my study. Um, and, you know, I'm sure we could, and, and there's feelings involved in that, right? Of like, this no longer feels like this person's trying to help me. This feels, you know, personal or somehow like, you know, that they, they have a message to send about the kind of work that I do, uh, rather than how I was doing that work. And I think that that, uh, that kind of, um, you know, emotional affective component uh, can really inhibit folks' willingness to put themselves out there and try on new things, including openness and transparency. And I think that, you know, for early career researchers, that that's, that's a huge barrier for early career researchers to feel like, yes, I want to go try this new thing, when already I might be getting feedback that, again, is, is critical feedback is great, it's, it's constructive. Um, so I think it's important, again, to just really consider how effective cultural aspects may need to shift in order for us to truly adopt open science practices across our field. Uh, and to, to allow this um, kind of effective shift in culture uh, to occur, I think we need uh, two kind of big things. We need to allow time for change, uh, and we need, we need to make it safe uh, for participants uh, to engage in these practices, uh, or for researchers to engage in these practices. So in allowing time for change, people are going to make mistakes, uh, and it takes time to adopt new practices. It takes time to develop expertise in the practice, uh, and if we are committed to openness and transparency, there needs to be patience and support in this adoption process. Uh, we need to actively support, encourage, and mentor growth. Um, and I think, again, that's particularly important for early career researchers to know that if I try out a pre-registration and it doesn't quite work the first time, that you know, I'm not going to be kicked out of the Open Science Club or something, uh, that, that there's a community behind that's uh, really focused on supporting and growing expertise in these practices. Uh, and I, again, I also think uh, that we need to make it safe uh, for people to participate in it. Um, we need to allow researchers to participate at their own pace and kind of reject that all or nothing mindset. Um, and we need to allow researchers 
to participate in different ways. We need to have more um, space at the table. Uh, again, I really struggled with this and a lot of open science materials I read er very early on uh, where so much of it was written from a positivist lens or kind of a post-positivist lens that um, that's not the kind of work I do and that's not necessarily the paradigm uh, that I align with. Um, and so I, I was looking and I was eager to find um, more work and more dialogue about, well, how does someone like me who approaches my work, not in that way, how do I adopt these practices? Where, where do I fit in in this narrative? Um, so I think there needs to be space for folks who want to do this work, maybe for different reasons uh, and, or in new ways. Uh, but again, so that the shift can occur across our field, not just in a very narrow type of educational research um, or a very narrow educational paradigm. Um, being kind in feedback, um, again, I think that goes back to like being supportive and encouraging of like when people try something and it doesn't quite work, or maybe they need to do something differently the next time, uh, looking to be supportive and grow expertise uh, within the community rather than gatekeep. Um, and then finally, I think there needs to be um, caution when comparing scholars with transparent work versus less transparent work, um, making sure that we are embracing uh, kind of the risks that come with openness, acknowledging what it takes for someone to be open, respecting that, and saying that you know there may be a difference in not necessarily work quality, but outcomes of people who are like, I'm putting everything on the table, you can completely see what I did, versus outcomes of, you're not really sure how people got to where they got. Um, so again, I, I think the cultural affective shift that needs to happen is going to be uh, huge for whether or not we actually see adoption of open science practices becoming more widespread or kind of staying within a smaller community. Yeah, we actually added this be kind and feedback. That was an ulterior motive for us. So just a reminder to exactly. everyone. Be kind after about we finish. Yes. <laughs> um, so now, now we're going to move on to the, kind of the, the last portion here. So don't fall asleep quite yet. Um, uh, kind of what is your role in the movement and when thinking about early career researchers when thinking about my own kind of foray into open science I actually think about um, a few years ago a friend of mine invited me to go uh, to this gym with him and I, I'm not really the gym type uh, I don't exercise that much which is bad uh, don't don't let that be the message from today but um, I finally agreed to go with him and we go to this gym and everyone at this gym is very athletic. Um, they're, they have lots of muscles and uh, the much larger than me. And they, they are very passionate about what they were doing at this gym. And then on top of that, like I look around this gym and there's just all these tools and, and yeah, equipment. I, I didn't even know where, I, I didn't know it was exercise equipment. I had no idea what it was and that you could use it for exercising. And, and uh, you might be able to guess what type of gym this is, but um, I, I, I think back to that experience and early career researchers really sometimes feel like this. We come into this, you know, open science and there's a lot of really intelligent, bright people who are very passionate about this work. And then you look around and there's these, these tools that we should start using, but you're not exactly sure how that, that fits into your own work. And so, it can be very daunting. And uh, Sarah, Emily, and I really get that. We, un we understand that feeling and, and that's okay. It's like, if, if you wanna be successful with this, you, you have to feel, you have to be okay with feeling vulnerable. And so um, I think it's also important to recognize that open science practices can take a lot of extra time and resources. And even though they sometimes appear to be very straightforward at first, uh, you know, things like pre-registration and open data, th those practices are, are pretty complex. They involve multiple steps and, and oftentimes require additional training. And so uh, there are these disclaimers, but even with that, we, we do believe that open science practices can benefit early career researchers and there's a place for us in, in, in this, uh, there's a role for us. And so, uh, you know, open science practices can really distinguish your work uh, especially when applying for jobs. Um, it can lead to more credible and reproducible work and uh, have many benefits like broad dissemination and increased impact. 
so there's definitely some benefits to getting involved. Uh, so what can you do today? I, 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 I say this too much, but I, I think trying something new is really important. There, there are many practices such as posting preprints or sharing your open materials that can be done without much training or time. Uh, and you can also get creative with some of these practices. You know, uh, we talked today about early career researchers uh, using their dissertation as a registered report, you know, which ensures publication. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of researchers on, on this, this call today that could talk for a very long time about the struggles of getting their dissertation published, right? And so there are definitely advantages to kind of using some of these, uh, these tools uh, for our good. So um, we also recommend that early career researchers connect with others uh, who are interested in this topic, engage in conversations, you know, talk with your peers, talk with your colleagues, get on social media, attend conferences, which you're already doing, uh, but don't be afraid to ask questions, you know, as, as the future generation of researchers, I, we really believe that our voice and, and perspective are important to moving this, uh, moving open science forward within education. Um, sorry, I'm seeing some really like great comments in the chat and I wanna like be, respond to them, but I also know that I'll totally get distracted. Um, but one of the things that I saw pop up was this idea that like, we may not be able to adopt all practices at the same time that may not even be ideal for a project that may not fit the project. Um, and I think that, you know, lends itself really, really nicely to this next kind of point of like, how can mid career researchers who maybe have a little more expertise, a little more practice in this, um, how can they uh, support early career researchers in um, adopting open science practices and how they can support um, kind of this cultural shift in this movement towards these practices more broadly in our field. Um, and I think modeling that, you know, modeling this idea of I'm going to try practices on, I'm going to use these practices for this project, and then I'm going to add one or subtract one for another project because it really doesn't fit quite right. Um, so mentoring and modeling those practices, I think, is really, really key, um, you know, from, from the perspective of an early career researcher. It's uh, that kind of middle career researcher feels attainable to me. It feels like, oh, I, I can see myself in a few years kind of being closer to, to that point in my career. Um, collaborate with us and collaborate with each other. Um, try something new. Again, you know, I think Jesse mentioned that we say it a lot, but I think it's really important. Uh, and, you know, circling back to the affective component, I think encouraging each other, encouraging us, um, encouraging uh, the field to embrace these, to explore these, to um, not get uh, stuck in what we know, to not kind of get that complacent of, well, this has worked, you know, it worked in my doc program, it clearly worked for my advisor, so I'm going to just keep doing the same thing. Uh, but encourage yourself and each other to, to resist that complacency and to um, try to push yourself in the field towards, um, towards having that kind of cultural shift in adoption of practices. Um, next, there has been a lot of dialogue, I think, over the last two days about training. And I really think that there's an opportunity to integrate practices into courses and assignments for doctoral students. Um, if this is in you know, doctoral training seminars or in other kind of doctoral level classes that you're running um, or instructing. And then uh, I also think there's an opportunity for middle career researchers to um, advocate or actually enact uh, open science practices within doctoral milestones. So that might look like um, as a part of my doctoral training program, I have to do a pre-registration or I have to make my open date, my data and my materials for my dissertation study that it's required to be made open. That that's a component of my dissertation. That's a component that I'm assessed on by my committee. So I think there's ways to embed some of these practices uh, to help normalize them um, a little bit more. Uh, I think middle career researchers can also start those uh, start journal clubs, the reproducibility um, activities that I know open, uh, the Open Science Center has done before, and I know Jesse and Brian are both involved in at UVA, um, and then uh, engaging in like pre-review. Okay, thanks, Sarah Emily. So this is the last slide, you made it. Um, we saved the best for last. Um, 
when I was eight years old, my, my neighbors, uh, his dad got fired from his job. They, uh, this isn't a sad story. He got a new job and everything was fine. But um, he, I remember this phrase being told to me and I, it didn't make any sense to me, but they're like, yeah, he, he lost his job. They, they got new owners and you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And, and it didn't make any sense to me. I was like, why can't an old dog learn new tricks? Like, that doesn't make any sense. But as, as I've gotten older, you know, even now, like there are some tricks that I just can't do, you know, the, uh, the, those, uh, you know, hoverboards, I just, I can't, I can't ride them. I, I hurt myself. So um, I, I understand why there might be some senior researchers who struggle with open science. You know, they're being asked to change the way they've been doing things for many years. And uh, they're being asked to open up their data sets, you know, asked to be more transparent uh, about research that they've built their careers around. And that, that's not an easy change, you know? And so uh, I, as important as I think grassroots efforts are, uh, you know, efforts from early career researchers and others. I, I really believe in those. I, I think senior researchers really have to step up uh, to the plate where they, you know, where they have influence at universities, at funding bodies, you know, journals, they're, they're editors at journals, they review grants and, and advocate for, for the change. Um, and really uh, working together all three stages, you know, anyone can really do any of the three, but we thought that these were kind of the steps that were most appropriate for each stage. But, uh, you know, working together, uh, everyone involved, uh, we, we really believe that there's some really positive change that we can make if we kind of, if we all work on, you know, where, where we have influence and, and improving what we can. So that is the end. Thank you for listening and, and staying. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, Jesse. Um, everyone, please join me in sort of a round of applause. The, the Zoom doesn't quite uh, imitate that perfectly, but I do love these uh, applause emojis. I really appreciate hearing your perspective. Um, I, I, I don't know what others, uh, we'll open it up for questions in just a moment, but I'll take the uh, kind of host prerogative to, um, to, to start it off, I, I was really struck by the, uh, you know, the cannon fodder or, va or uh, Vanguard, or of course, you know, going into the gym and uh, having some of that, what, <laughs> what do I do first here? And, and I think that's a perspective that um, a lot of people can relate to. It's not early career researchers, it's anybody stepping into um, a community, a, a suite of activities, uh, uh, for the first time, it can be it can be scary. It can be daunting. There's there, there, there's a, a lot to take in, and um, a lot of the themes that you touched on of criticizing with kindness. You know, a lot of what we're asking folks to do or, or trying to model ourselves is, is is a new step, and it's the first time. Everybody does something for the first time, and so recognizing that that type of criticism has to be. Um, given with that in mind is the only is the only successful way to, to 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 really move forward if we don't and we're asking folks to do these optional things and that just leads to punishment uh, brian shared that a couple of stories in in the chat also we're, we're gonna we're gonna peter out we're not gonna be successful um I, i'm wondering of of the initiatives or projects or activities you've seen in the past 48 hours um, today and, and yesterday's uh, sessions, what do you think is most, what do you personally have the most motivation to um, continue working on towards or being a part of, or what, what, what do you think is most, um, uh, what are you most optimistic about from what you've seen recently? Um, either uh, Jesse or Sarah. Uh, oh, I can, I can take a, uh, you know, crack at that question. Um, I think one of the things that I've been most impressed with over the last 48 hours is not necessarily one single project or like one specific talk. Um, honestly, that I, I was just most impressed with the consensus regarding the problems. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of times in 
you know, when you have a group of people and people can come to the table like, this is the problem, no, this is the problem, no, this is the problem. And that can really inhibit any form of momentum moving forward because you can't even agree on what the things are that you need to be addressing. And I think that I was really impressed with how consistent the dialogue and discourse was across sessions of that, okay, we have a good agreement on what we need to address. And that feels like that we can actually then move forward with kind of solutions oriented conversations because we at least agree on the first part of the conversation. And sometimes that's the hardest. Um, so again, not necessarily a single project or discussion that I've heard, but more of just the, the continuity between discussions that we really do feel like most of us are on the same page, uh, which I think is a good place to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna echo that. I, I think the last 48 hours for me have, have been very impressive, a, a group of you know, very diverse uh, scholars from around the world coming together. Uh, you know, I, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but um, I, I wasn't a full believer in the unconference at first, but I, I think it's been very effective to, to allow individuals to think together and to collaborate and work together. Um, and so it's been very impressive that, you know, we as this wide range of individuals can come together and really begin to, to solve some of the problems that we see. Uh, secondly, uh, I, the community has been very open and welcoming. I didn't expect otherwise, but, but everyone has been really, really great to work with. Um, and so, yeah, I've just been really kind of impressed with the opportunity to collaborate and uh, work on problems together. And that's, you know, thinking about education, there's so many different, you know, we're in special education, but there's so many different schools and, and thoughts about education and that we can all come together and work together and agree on something that gives me, you know, hope for what we can do for the future. Yeah, I think absolutely. I, I echo that just as a lot of, um optimism to be excited about. Um, I want to open it up to others uh, for questions or comments, and we can also transition to sort of a, a round table um, format, a little bit of a sort of a reflection on, um, on the past few days and, and what the next steps will be. I, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I. I. Sorry, I don't want to take a jump to the front of the line, but um, I tried to use enough wait time before I. I, I chimed in. Um, so I, I was just thinking back to a, a conversation I had with, with someone a couple of years ago, and and this is I, I'd be interested, Sarah Emily and, and Jesse, in your perspective, but anybody's uh, thoughts on this. Around. I, I think one common element uh, around the different open science practices, um, uh, approaches that, that we've been talking about, perhaps some more so than others, but they all take extra time, extra effort. Um, uh, it, it, for some of these practices, it, it, it's ongoing time and, and resource commitment. Um, I, I just worry about balancing that or, 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 or how do others perceive balancing that with the almost insane level of, of commitment that academia asks, uh, and not just academia, profession, being a professional uh, around, uh, being a, a scientist. I, I, I so wish we could slow down things a little bit. I, I, I could be just way off base here, but in my head, I think of, of open science as almost an effort to let's slow down a little bit. And instead of just rushing the heck through everything and moving from one study and one article uh, to the next as fast as we possibly can, because the goal is to have the longest CV, um, but let's slow down and do it the best and most transparent and most credible, most replicable uh, way that we can. And it just takes longer. Um, I don't know, I, 
I feel some of that tension. I think I feel less of it because I'm I the good fortune to, to, to be tenured and um, promoted. And, and, and so you, th there comes a certain freedom with that, but I'm still I've been in part of this, just, I don't want to call it a rat race exactly, but the system where it is just boom, 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 next thing, next thing, next thing. And, and I wonder how we carve out a space for open science in that. I don't know if I necessarily have the answer to that, but um, yeah, if you do, that, like, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I echo that sentiment, you know, I, and I think that even being three years into my doctoral program, I already have experienced working with uh, certain collaborators that I'm like, maybe I will not collaborate with you again because we have a different idea of the pacing of our work or the quality of the work that I feel like I want to hold myself to versus this like, you know, we're just going to kind of slap something together to have, you know, to keep moving quickly. Um, so I think that's, for me, like being like, feeling like I can have that conversation openly with more senior professors, I think is the first step into like, oh, that's, that's something that's okay for me to feel. It's okay for me to think. It's okay for me to think about. Um, I can choose to, um, you know, maybe watch how others are operating their work and I can choose to operate differently. I can choose to slow it down and I can choose to be more intentional about this. Um, and I think just uh, as silly as it sounds, just knowing that that's an okay thing to explore and allow myself. Um, not that I, you know, it's not like giving permission, but again, just like make, knowing that that's an okay thing to think and experience. Um, honestly, I think is a, is a good first step in trying to kind of shift that kind of rat race mentality of how quickly can we turn things out. Every day I still talk when I'm muted. Um, I, I don't wanna um, call Colleen out, but I, I, I thought the, the comment that she made in the, uh, in the chat was, was just excellent. Uh, Colleen, are you on? Do you mind uh, just sharing your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it's, I, I think about this every time I go to design a study, right? Like I have moments where I'm like, okay, we could design this super quick study just like get it done. And even when I say that it's not true anyway. So I find this time, this time piece I keep coming back to as well. Um, but I think as a field, right? If we think about having five studies of, you know, borderline quality in terms of what that, what we learn from that compared to one, you know, really well done study, like it's the idea of meta-analysis, right? Like if everything you put in the meta-analysis wasn't well done, it doesn't matter that there's this many studies now, right? Like, um, and so I think the time investment piece um, and the pacing, it's something I really struggled with in, in, in my lab, especially advising my students because, you know, they've got five years to try to have some papers on their CV and uh, five years is actually not that much time <laughs> uh, given the publication process. So I think there's a real, a real conflict between time spending the time to do this type of work and um, the incentives to, to publish. Um, so even though I think lots of open science things will actually help like open data, right? If I can tell my students go to this data set somebody already has, like in the long run that should actually save time, so. And, and I think that same message around it's it's better science it contributes more to the one really well done uh, hopefully open study contributes more to the evidence base I, I I think there's a similar case can be made for one's career too that at least in my experience um, those uh, higher profile, but hopefully uh, that corresponds with, with higher quality, more meaningful studies. That's what I, I think really helps uh, progress you up the, the career uh, ladder more than just pumping out. I, I, there's some of it probably has to do with, with quantity and just counting things up. But, but I think the, the quality aspect sometimes gets undersold and 
and I, I think there is a there is room for the the value of of really good uh, and and open science to be done. I think this is tangentially related to that, um, but I think as a an, an, another kind of you know ask as an early career researcher, what I would ask people who are more senior in the field is to, uh, especially as you are thinking about how to support your doc students. You know, there's a lot of pressure as a doc student of like, and my advisor, you know, Bill Therian is in this room, so I'm saying that, so, you know, that there's a lot of pressure to balance between what Bill, you know, talks so much about, and I work very closely with Brian, and these things that I want to do and value in my practice, and then I walk into a doctoral seminar taught by another professor who does not value those at all, and has very different expectations for what success looks like in research, and it can feel really conflicting of like, I'm getting two very different messages. Um, and so I, I think there is also a role for uh, middle and senior career researchers to um, also have that dialogue within their departments about what is the messaging given to doc students, uh, especially within doc student seminars. Um, you know, can we have more of a common or shared um, kind of charge to doc students or a shared message to doc students? Because um, just personally, it, it's, that has been a challenging aspect to kind of navigate of. I have one, you know, the person leading my doc student seminar is very focused on, you need to have blank publications by the time you leave or you will not get a job versus you should be doing high quality intentional work. And it's okay if it's only, you know, a few publications, but they're really, really strong, that that's what matters. Uh, and so, you know, having those conversations uh, above a doc student level, I think would be helpful. So, in our last few minutes, I, I wanted to pose a question to to everybody, um, and I won't call on everybody, but, but feel free to either think about the response or, or, or chime in. Um, but thinking about what what next? What's the the one thing that you um, are going to sort of take away at, or, or or try to do next um, after this? And, and I'll answer first, just to get the ball rolling just for a second but there are a couple of hackathons that i really want to continue on uh creating some guides and um uh, we're not going to call it this but the what doesn't work clearing house the conversation that happened there i think has a lot of fruitful momentum and trying to figure out the best way to continue and grow this community conversation those are some of the things that um i know i'll be thinking about over the next few days and i'll, I'll pose that to everybody in our last few minutes too can I add one thing? Um, this is sort of what I was thinking of saying earlier, but I think one important step is to realize that for many of us, we are the open science person in our communities. Like we have all come together from all over the world and we're like learning from each other. And this is great. This is the open science community. But then we go back to our departments and we are the person with the most knowledge, even if we feel like it's nothing. And so I think just in general, a good step is to like take whatever you've learned here and talk about it with your colleagues, bring up these concerns, um, that sort of thing. So it is nice to have this like central focus and I'll let us get back to that. But I also want us to recognize that even though we might not feel like the open science person, like in my experience, it's very easy to all of a sudden find yourself in a room like I know more about this than everyone around me. And that's a little bit shocking because I don't feel like I know anything. Um, so uh, definitely, I think that's an important part of continuing this mis mission is to just like raise awareness of what this is and why it's valuable. Um, but in terms of like next steps, um, I don't know how other hackathons have went, but we've, um, in at least the group uh, with Ethan Brown and such, we've, we've exchanged emails and we're on Twitter to connect and sort of keep this idea momentum going forward. I don't know if other people have other ideas. I, I'll echo that idea of trying to to keep this going and keep the momentum going. I, um, I I was very interested to see what what especially with it being online in the middle of a pandemic, which is uh, obviously un, un, unfortunate on uh, lots of different dimensions. Uh, but I, I'm very interested to see if this. Uh, 
continues in the direction of, of, of SIPS or the Society for the Improvement of Psychological uh, Psych Psychological Science, uh, and uh, to 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 try to help this grow and continue, and and look forward to uh, both some perhaps some act ongoing activities, but uh, then to a, a bigger, hopefully in person meeting next year and, and continuing to grow this. Cause I, I think that's, um, you, we, we can start it, but, but it, it has to, to grow to really have some, some big effects if it isn't just uh, to remain kind of a niche uh, thing that, that a few of us are into. hopefully turning, uh, getting rid of even the phrase open science and just it's successful, it just becomes science, the, the MO of science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody, thank you so much for your participation, for your energy. Um, as Brian just mentioned, it's, you know, <laughs> it's tough out there. So thank you for your, uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for your contributions. Um, this will continue. So, and that will, and that's because of, of, of you. So thank you so much.